Here we are. Uh, well, good morning to those. I already been talking to people in, in sanctuary. Uh, so, for those of you who are joining uh, via um, uh, YouTube or Facebook, welcome. We are excited that you decided to join us uh, here at Epiphany Fellowship. Um, Y'all missing out what's happening in here. They got a whole spill uh, of what's happening, and you'll hear some of those things. Um, but we we do want you to push uh, to come collectively uh, to God's house to hear the voices of your brothers and sisters as they worship in the midst of pain, in the midst of trial, uh, in the midst of victory, um, because I think there's encouragement in that. So, brother, sister, if you sit there today at home, make your way here next week so that we can lift our voices together and worship our great God and King. Uh, let's sing, let's sing. We ain't gonna say no. We gonna go back old school a little bit, so y'all, y'all gotta clap your hands like you at an old Baptist church. Y'all know what's in me. Come on, clap. Woo! That clap feel good. Come on. Don't get tired of clapping, everybody. Clap your hands. The song says this. Y'all know this. It said, "Oh Lord, we pray." We glorify you, oh Lord, we lift your name up high in all the earth, oh Lord, we magnify thee and bless, bless your holy name. You kind of bop, come on, high and all, high and all in earth. Hey, let's do verse two. Say, in throne, in throne. Said to the Lord our God, to the Lord our God. It's to the Lord our God, to the Lord our God. Hey, verse three. Said the world, the world creator has made himself so low and given the south. That's good news right there. Come on, let's lift it up. Said that God, that God who is so holy has crushed, crushed his crushed one and only. But now, but now whoop, that's good news right there. Come on, say high and on the earth. Hey, he said high and on the earth. High and on the earth. Hey, Said the world's the world's creator has made himself so low and given us salvation. What a miracle! Come on, that, that God who is so holy.
about to really exalt them. Come on. Said we exalt thee. Said we exalt thee. We exalt thee. Said high in all the earth. High in all the earth. Come on. Said Lord, we live to. Lord, we live to. High in all the earth. Said Lord, we live to. Lord, we live to. Said high in all the earth. Said, Lord, we live to. Lord, we live to. Said, high in all the earth. High in all the earth. Said, be exalted. Be exalted. Said, high in all the earth. High in all the earth. Hey, said, rain forever. Rain forever. Said, high in all the earth. Won't you reign forever? Reign forever. Hey, to high and all the earth. 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 of your situation. Rain forever. High in all the earth. Now that you know he reigns, we exalt you. High in all the earth. Be Let me, let me clarify something where you think that you have the power within yourself to exalt a God who does not need your help. In case you thought that you exalt him, that you declaring that he reigns forever makes him reign forever. How about this? Watch this. He doesn't need you to declare anything. What you are doing is you're helping the very thing that feels the opposite way of the reality of who God is and where he is. What do I mean by that? You exalt things in your own personal life. It doesn't take much for your soul to exalt yourself. It doesn't take your, 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 your innate being to exalt some foreign object. It's a part of your DNA. For all have sinned. What you are doing when you sing songs like this to a God who is already exalted, who already reigns, is you're helping your, your weak soul come to a place of truth because of who God is. Don't you ever think that you saying be exalted, reign forever, is putting him on the throne. He's already there. What you are doing, friends, is you're helping your feeble and weak mind, heart, and soul get to the reality that our God reigns forever. And because he reigns forever, Because he has done everything for us, 
we say we serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. Yeah. Yeah. It's a new song, but it's simple. We serve a mighty God. Should we serve a holy God? We serve an awesome God. He's my Savior, my Savior. We serve, we serve a mighty God. Said we serve, we serve a holy God. We serve an awesome God. We serve an awesome God. He's my Savior, my Savior, my Savior. Y'all know it now. Come on. Said we serve, we serve a mighty God. We serve a holy God. We serve a holy God. Come on, let's lift our voices in here. We serve. We serve my Savior, my Savior, my Savior, we serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. And we serve a holy God. We serve. We serve an awesome God. He's my Savior, my Savior. One more time. We serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. Come on, it's a simple song. Come on, sing we with us. We serve a holy God. We serve Simple song, y'all got it by now. We, we serve a holy Come on, let your voice and say, We serve an awesome God. He's my Savior. My Savior. Has He saved anybody my in the room? Come on, said we serve.
proclaim you're a mighty God, yeah.
words. Here's your response. There are no words that I could say to glorify that great name when others are ashamed to say I will still Proclaim. I will still proclaim. Y'all waiting on me. I will still proclaim. I will still proclaim. I will still proclaim. You're mine. Because you are Alpha. We didn't practice this. I'm sorry. You are worthy to. I'm just trying to stir your affections for the God who is holy and righteous, who is, was, and is to come. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you. Get to the place that acknowledges our God. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Hey, we're going to do this next part. you came in here with but whatever it is both good and bad I want you to acknowledge your God as the one who is ruling over everything who is sovereign who loves you enough to save you who redeemed you who gave breath to you can we just lift up however it is for you can you just acknowledge your God right here in this moment
again, play it again. We give, we give you. It's okay to praise the Lord. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. You can continue to praise. If God has been good to you, you can continue to lift his name and worship him. Has God been good to anybody in here? Yeah. It's not just a, just a lip service, but the Bible calls us to live this thing out. Paul talks about proclaiming this gospel, not just what we say, but how we live, right? So it's okay to take a few more seconds to lift your hands and lift your voice and shout triumphantly to the God who has, who has changed your entire life. Has he been good to anybody in here? Welcome all of you guys. My name is Davon Miller. I wish you would have told me I was doing this. I would have ironed my shirt a little bit better, um, but it's all good. Listen, we're going to transition from worship to continue to worship. It's our giving, but before we get there, um, you guys can have a seat. You can have a seat because um, I specifically want to highlight and point out if anybody's here for the first time, would you please stand? If you're a first-time visitor, first time gathering with us on a Sunday, please stand. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Well, listen, on, the, on, on behalf of Epiphany Fellowship, we want to welcome you. We used to, like, really get in and, like, hug you and all that stuff, uh, but COVID is, like, real life. It's still active, and so that's why we ask to keep the mask on. But if you see them, if you're sitting next to them, dab them up, speak to them, holler at them on their way out so they, they can feel loved. Amen? All right. Amen. All right. First time visit. So, again, let's transition into giving. I want to read this uh, passage from Isaiah 55. He says, Come, everyone who is thirsty. Come to the water, and you without silver, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and, and milk. So what Isaiah is talking about here, I'm not preaching, this is real quick. What Isaiah is talking about here is a free gift. Somebody say free gift, right? But the interesting thing, the, although, although Isaiah is talking about a free gift, he says come and buy, right? Which points to the fact that it costs something, right? Which points to the fact that if it's free for you, somebody had to pay for it, Right? Somebody had to pay for this gift in order for it to be free for you. I'm not going to walk through the whole thing, but he's talking about this good news that will eventually come to God's people, right? Come to all the people, right? And so this idea that because it's free to us, us it points to this fact that God, um, using by, by way of his son, Jesus Christ, gives his life, right? Essentially gives everything he has, right? Pours out the full wrath of God on his son on the cross for us so that we can experience this free gift. Amen? Ain't anybody excited about that? I am excited about that. And in light of that, this is why we give, right? We don't give to help God. We give because God has helped us. God has gave us everything. We don't give to, 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 to merely just flex or, or we don't give with this idea that we're actually doing something. But us giving is a response or a reflection of where we are with God, right? Our disposition and our view towards God, right? And so I hope that helps you. We're going to go into our offertory responsive reading so i'll read um and then you go on I'll, I'll read the first part and you read the second part amen y'all get that all right who is the owner of all things yeah all right so we're gonna keep on going but i needed a little more um, in that, all right? Praise God. Who provides for us? Praise God. Amen. We're getting there. So a little more to sound. How are we to respond? How are we to give? The 
Amen. Amen. So as the baskets are going around, another way we are, you are able to give is online, right? You can go to Epiphany Fellowship. Um, uh, dot org slash give right and follow the instructions and the prompts there and if you're a member of Epiphany Fellowship make some noise if you're a member <laughs> praise God make some noise if you got that church center app that we've been talking about for like five years all right so you can give on there too so the baskets are going around which is a blessing in and of itself that shows that we're moving but because the baskets wasn't moving for like the past two years nobody was touching that um, so you can give online the church center app and again you can give in person so I got a few announcements real quick. Um, worship night. Anybody excited about worship night? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Like Pastor Vern said last week, we get to experience worship in here, right? Um, but it's time limit, right? Because you just got the decency in order. Worship night is decency in an order, no time limit, all right? <laughs> right? So um, we can just come, lift our hands, lift our voices, and just thoroughly just worship the Lord. We ain't got to go nowhere. I mean, it's probably ending at a certain time, but if Pastor Vern leading it, then just forget the ending time, right? Because he just don't respect time at all. Um, so worship night, man, we want y'all to be there. That is July 27th. That's a Wednesday. Somebody say Wednesday, July 27th. All right, so don't act like you ain't know. All right, training day. That sounds like the movie. Um, if you are currently, I'm just reading this. If you are currently serving in a ministry in the church, please prepare to attend training day on Sunday, July 31st. Somebody say July 31st. Make some noise if you serve somewhere at the Epiphany Fellowship. Yeah. All right. So I'm only asking y'all to make noise because I'm looking and I know you, you got to be there. July 31st is training day. Don't miss. There's going to be some food, music, giveaways, and critical information. That's the biggest thing, the critical information. You can get food anywhere else. Critical information. We need y'all to be there on July 31st, the Sunday, right? And then, all right, so we got some park, we got park day going up. Make some noise for park day. Wow, look at that. Praise God. Park day. Did y'all come to the, um, the rooftop? What's that? Social? Sunset? Was y'all there? Y'all had a good time? Yeah. Did y'all really have a good time? Yeah. All right, praise God. You know, yeah. All right, park day. That's our second park day of the year. It'll take place on Sunday, July 24th. Somebody say 24th. 24th. I'm just saying that. Don't act like you ain't know. After our 11 a.m. gathering, we're going to be at Elkins. Eakins Oval? I can't. The Oval. Y'all know where that is? Y'all from Philly? All right. <laughs> if you're not from Philly, ask somebody, yo, where is that place that he talked about? <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to just act like they spelled it wrong. I think it's spelled right, but whatever. All right, that is on, what date is that? Oh, July 24th. There we go. Praise God. July, that's this Sunday? Next Sunday. Next Sunday. Thank you, Pastor Matt. Thank you. All right, next Sunday. We want y'all to be there. And then last but not least, is this the same park day announcement? I don't know. But park day is popping. And so I did want to say this. I don't know if it's on there. But I did want to say this, that if you're, if you're, planning on coming to Park Day, also think through the aspect of they're going to need some help, right? So if you're serving somewhere, if you serve in any capacity, or if you don't serve in any capacity, think about not just coming to have a good time, but think about the back end, right? Because there's a lot of work that goes into that, and I'm pretty sure that there's um, some help needed. Am I right, or am I just talking? Praise God. We need some help, so we need some hands to the plow for that. Let me pray for us, and I'm going to just get out the way. All right, let's uh, go to the Lord. Go to the Lord. Father, we thank you and praise you. Uh, for yet another day of your faithfulness, um, your grace, and your mercy towards us. We um, thank you for all those who had to give, and we thank you for those who didn't have to give but so desire to give, which you um, allowed them to um, put them in a place where they are able um, to give. Again, we understand that we don't give to help you, but we give because you helped us. You gave us every single Thing we need. You gave it all in your son, um, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross. So again, we give from that disposition, not to get anything in return, but, but because you gave us everything already. So Father, um, help us to view giving rightly um, and truly see it as an uh, important aspect of how we worship you. Uh, we pray all these things in your son's name. Uh, amen. said this in the first service, I'll say it here as well, uh, that um, as believers, we, 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 we have an example in Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ doesn't just, just say, you know, give you words and then he leaves. He, he, he did it so strategically that we have what some of us carry in here every Sunday which is the word of God. Some of us carry it on our devices. That's for the, like, the new age. I, I can't do it. I, I like to have that paper just 
flip over and hear the crinkling of the paper. But either way, he's giving us, he's giving us uh, all that we need uh, to navigate this life. But, but, but scripture is specific in saying that we should, we should write them on our hearts. We should wear them around our necks like a necklace. We, we should have his very word so engraved in us that no matter who or what happens and comes against us, we know how to work and we know how to function in life. That's what, that's what James is, is saying. He, he said, y'all know. I need y'all to act on that. This is for an encouragement for those who have the word of God written on your heart. You, you know it. You, 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 you know how to d d uh, deflect the, the enemy when he comes. You, you have the, the, the resources in order uh, to fight off the enemy. But for some of us who don't have it, guard your heart. How can a young man keep his way pure? It's by guarding his heart with the word of God. My favorite verse is Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found and I did eat them and your words became a joy and a delight to my soul. I might not always be at the place where the word of God is the de a delight. But the more I sit and I soak in God's word, I want it to become a delight to me. No matter what it is that I'm reading, I know that it's God's word. And it's protecting me. All things work for the good of them. We take that out of context. But if you guard your heart, I promise you all things will work together for the good. I'm setting this song up as if it's one of them slower songs. It's really not. The song says, write them on the tablet of your heart. Let's do it together. Let's do it. Let's bop. Woo! Yep. Come on, clap your hands. Hey, come on. Should write them on, right? Y'all can get loose a little bit. Come on. I want to see y'all do it. Hey, should write them on the tablet of the heart. Yeah. This is what Jesus says. I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me will forever be fruitful indeed. Yeah, yeah. Said I am the way, said the truth and the light, no one gets to the Father except that he comes through me. Yeah. So let not mercy, let not mercy and truth said forsake you, forsake you, forsake you. Forsake let you. not mercy, let not mercy and, truth and truth said forsake you, forsake you, forsake you. Forsake Come on, write them you. on the tablet let of your heart. Some of y'all got it. Come on, everybody bounce and say, write them on the tablet. Hey, say, I am the way. I am the way. Hey, said the truth and the light. The truth and the light. No one gets to the Father. Said, except that. And let not mercy, mercy and truth, and truth. said forsake you, forsake you, forsake you, forsake you. Let not mercy, let not mercy, oh no, and truth. said forsake you, forsake you, forsake you, forsake you. Write them on, write them on the tablet of the heart. How can a young man keep his way?
your voices say, I will hide your word. Hide your word in my heart. Hey, said I will hide your word. Hide your word in my heart. Hey, I will hide your word. Hide your word in my heart. Trust in the, trust in the, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the. That's my, what they say, that's my jam right there. <laughs> the, the, oh, I mean, I'll, I'll give a little spoiler in the trailer to today's topic is going to be wisdom. That's some wisdom right there, right? All throughout the book of Psalms, throughout the book of Proverbs. I mean, goodness, you want a godly life. You want godly results in your life. Hide his word in your heart. That you ain't even got to exegete that. <laughs> you ain't got to go to no seminary for that. Just hide it in your heart. Amen. Um, so we're uh, continuing in our James series. Have y'all been enjoying the book of James series so far, your faith work? Yeah. James been jamming us up. Um, so we're going to be in chapter 3. Verses, thir- oh, we excited already. Chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. 
Let's read together. Say it with your chest so I don't have to ask you to start over and do it again. Um, chapter 3, James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. One, two, three, read. So uh, a sermon title for today is show and prove which wisdom are you working with? Show and prove which wisdom are you working with? Go ahead, have a seat. I got some stuff I want to make sure I get through here today. Most high God, we thank you. <laughs> the old church say uh, if I had a thousand tongues, couldn't thank you enough. true it is. Um, God, be with the deliverer, the delivery of your message. Be with the reception and the recipient of your message today. God, may the words um, fall on fertile ground, be watered, uh, have roots that grow deep and spring up into all types of good fruit um, and ultimately conform us to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, it's in that matchless name of our Messiah that we pray. Amen. Um, so I'll jump right in so I don't run out of time. Um, I used to love watching nature shows. You know, Discovery Channel, Animal Planet. All that. Anybody used to love that? Am I the only, I'll geek out by myself. Up here, y'all can be bored here, but I used to like it. Right now, if you didn't, it's okay. But like, I mean, I would sit there and, and now not if the, if the NBA game on or NFL game, I'm watching at first. But if if nothing else is on, I'm like, yo, let me peep this. And I mean, I, I used to like documentaries like um, uh, Blue Planet. And planet Earth, and it showed all types of amazing things in God's creation. The depths of the sea and, and all types of animals. And then they would never give you, like, mundane average animals. It would always be something that you've never seen before or didn't even know existed, right? It, you know, uh, um, uh, things like, uh, you know, the Venus flytrap, right? A plant that eats other living Things like insects. That's, that's freaky, right? Or y'all ever seen, if you've ever watched a show, like there's this thing called the anglerfish, right? Lives in the depths of the ocean, high pressure, freezing temperatures, ugly looking thing. And, and it has like a little uh, uh, shootout from its head that illuminates because it's so dark down there, but also is, is a lure to help draw prey, right? Crazy, right? Um, I remember another one I saw that was uh, the peregrine falcon. Apparently, the fastest known flying animal on the planet, uh, it flies probably over 60 miles an hour. But, but when it dive bombs, right, because it, it, well, half of its prey is other birds, smaller birds. When it dives bomb from on top to, to surprise another bird, it can exceed 200 miles per hour at peak speed. A bird, right? That's pretty crazy. So all types of interesting animals. But one of the most interesting um, that I ever came across was this thing called, uh, on the show, a thing called a, a king snake. Now, if you're not familiar with a king snake, pay attention. I'm going to learn you something. Not from my own knowledge, but because I watched Discovery Channel back in the day. Um, uh, the king snake has notoriety because it mimics another snake. The king snake is often confused with and or mistaken for the coral snake. Now, again, because it mimics the coral snake, it poses, it masquerades, if you will. The king snake is a snake in its own right, uh, but it's not the snake that it makes itself seem to be. 
It's essentially a counterfeit. Both the king snake and the coral snake are brightly colored and have similar markings, leading people and animals to think or believe that these two different snakes are the same. They even live in the same habitat sometimes. They are similar in that they are both snakes and on the surface seem to be the same at first glance, but they are not the same. Uh, The king snake is not venomous. See, you already learned something, but well, some of y'all might know that not all snakes are venomous, but not only is the king snake not venomous, it doesn't even have fangs. Bet you ain't know that. See, not every snake has fangs. It has small conical shaped teeth and the bite is not even harmless to humans, right? Because the king snake uh, hunts smaller prey or other snakes, and it kills it by constriction, all right? And so the king snake is not venomous at all. Now, by contrast, the coral snake is venomous. Its venom has extremely powerful neurotoxins, which affect the brain's ability to control muscles. And if you're bitten by a coral snake, symptoms would include vomiting, paralysis, slurred speech, muscle twitching, and yes, even death. So it's safe to say it would be beneficial wouldn't you agree to know the difference between a king snake and a coral snake, but how does one do so if they both look the same? The king snake mimics the coral snake. So at first glance, you may not be able to tell it apart, so it's important to learn the characteristics, the differences between the king snake and the coral snake. Y'all with me? All right, I'm going somewhere with this, right? And so there's even a catchy phrase that people in nature have come up with to help us remember and learn the difference so that you don't get bitten and go into paralysis and die. All right, and so the, the, the phrase goes, um, red and yellow kills a fellow, Right. V- red and black venom lack. Right. Some some of y'all know this. Right. Y'all kicking out with me. Right. So 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 pay attention. So that means that the king snake and coral snake both have bands of three colors, red, yellow and black. But if the black and the red touch each other uh, on their bands on the body of the snake, then you're not really dealing with a venomous snake. You're looking at a snake that looks like the coral snake, but it's actually a king snake. It's really harmless to you. All right. Now. You can play that game with the other snake, the coral snake, if you want. But if the red and yellow bands touch each other, then you can face potential death. Red and yellow kills a fellow. All right. And so it's important to know the difference between these two because many times it will change how you maneuver when you're around them. It can even mean the difference between life and death. James uses some of the same idea in his uh, 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 spill right here after he talks about the tongue uh, in chapter 3. And he talks about two different wisdoms, right? Now, the funny thing is he's playing on this a little bit because there's not really two different kinds of wisdom. There is an authentic wisdom, and then there is the counterfeit wisdom, all right? So you have the king snake wisdom and then the coral snake wisdom. So James wants to point out to people, and he's not transitioning into anything different here. He's got done talking about faith and how it looks authentic, evidenced by your work and, and what you do and how you live, especially among others. He talks about the tongue and how it impacts others and what you do around others. And now he's talking about wisdom, right? Not some esoteric or theoretical idea, right? But wisdom is evidence, as we'll see momentarily, in how it's played out in life and among others. Cool? All right. So first, before we get in, so I'm not talking past anybody and we're talking about the same terms, let's define wisdom. Okay? Now, Oxford defines wisdom as this. Oxford's dictionary says, the soundness of an action or decision with regard to the application of experience, knowledge, and good judgment. Right? Now, I'm going to give you a biblical definition Um, in a moment after I give some some things, some important reasons as to why it's important to treasure wisdom. But uh, you're you're going to be hard-pressed to find one single definition on what biblical wisdom is. There's many theologians, uh, uh, many Bible readers, even you yourself, if you've been in the faith for some time, can come up with your own concise definition of what biblical wisdom is. So I have one that's kind of a hodgepodge of of different... um, Uh, Christian ideas of what biblical wisdom is, and we'll get to it in a second, but why are we even concerned about wisdom? 
All right? Well, let's say uh, Proverbs 16, 16 says, get wisdom. How much better is it than gold? And get understanding it is preferable to silver. Right? So if I'm going to exegete that really uh, quickly, is that to say that all the wealth in the world is not as valuable as wisdom from above. All right? So you got a bag that you can get, and then you got wisdom. Right? Wisdom is more valuable. Proverbs 4, 6, and 7. Don't abandon wisdom, and she will watch over you. Love her, and she will guard you. Wisdom is supreme, so get wisdom, and whatever else you get, get understanding. All right? Now, if you notice, this is a little bit redundant, right? And whenever the Bible is repetitious and many verses are redundant, then that means that, hey, pay attention. I'm saying this again so that you can get the point. All right? So don't abandon wisdom. Proverbs 3.13, happy or blessed is a man who finds wisdom and who acquires understanding. So there you got three verses being extra redundant, just in case you didn't get it, that wisdom is valuable. You don't want to see it and just say, ah, I'm cool. This should be the chief thing that you're searching for in a human life. Now, wisdom is mentioned about 40, 41 times in the book of Proverbs alone. That's not counting the other possibly couple of hundred times in the rest of the Bible, Old and New Testament. So we're going to go through some uh, um, uh, wisdom words, and then we're going to get into the verses. In the Old Testament, y'all, y'all with me still? Make sure you're paying attention. Okay, so in the Old Testament, wisdom, the Hebrew word, and we've heard this from Pastor Mason before, actually, is chokhmah. All right? So somebody wiped the mic off when I get down because I just spit all over it. But, you know, the Hebrew, that guttural, you got to get that in there. You know what I'm saying? So y'all say that with me. Say, now, you can say it because you got a mask on, so we good. All right? So chokhmah. All right, that is the Hebrew word um, for wisdom. Now, it has several, uh, 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 I guess, definitions or connotations, depending on the context. But in general, we'll mean skilled in war, skilled in administration, shrewdness, prudence in religious affairs or know-how, especially in ethical situations. Now, in the New Testament, you have the same idea, the same word. It would be sophos for wise. And for wisdom, it would be Sophia. So I'll pause. Now, is there anybody in here named Sophia? No? Oh, there we go. One right there. Uh, okay. Right. So in most cases, that word, that name is derived from wisdom in Koine Greek. All right. And so Sophia, um, it, it means generally broad and full of intelligence, but also varied knowledge of things human and divine acquired by acuteness and experience but summed up in maxims and proverbs also the act of interpreting dreams and always giving the sagest advice skilled in management of affairs devout and proper prudence get this in interactions with people who are not disciples of christ it's used in that context in the new testament uh skill and discretion in imparting christian truth Right. The knowledge and practice of what is required for godly and upright living. So if I put it all together, I came up with some ideas about uh, 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 what wisdom would be kind of mixing it all together. So wisdom, true wisdom in the biblical context is seeing things from God's perspective and making decisions based on that perspective. Because according to Proverbs 1, 7, the key to accessing wisdom is to fear and reverence or have a high respect for the Most High God. So this means that even though people who don't name the name of Christ can tap into aspects of wisdom, to get it at its core, you can't even access the lock unless you first fear, honor, and reverence God. That's where wisdom begins. Uh, This manifests most frequently in our thinking, our speech, our character, choices, and actions, especially in how we treat others. It is manifest in our actions among others. Right? Think about it. Uh, Wisdom is the ability to merge what you know with how you live. This is what proves what you believe because wisdom, and, and also faith for that matter, is not merely knowledge or merely intellectual. Because one can choose to not adhere to what they know. This shows that you don't believe what you have information about. 
showing that you are unwise. It's easy to be in close proximity to or even well acquainted with facts, truth, and principles. But if you don't apply them to your life, you not only lack wisdom, but you're moving in the other and opposite direction, which is becoming a fool. All right. If you're not wise, then you're being foolish. So think about it. Right. Wisdom is not just a mere uh, mental assent to some knowledge. Right. It means that God has said something. You agree and, and believe it. And if you do, you will act accordingly. If you don't, this means that now you know something, but you have made a choice not to do it. You are being foolish and not wise. All right. Knowledge is what bolsters intellect, but wisdom bolsters and improves insight, right? This is why you can have a bunch of smart people walking and roaming around the earth, right? Um, uh, but they don't have wisdom, right? Intellect does not mean wisdom. It just means that you have a high IQ and you can still not have wisdom. Think about it. Our adversary, the enemy, the Satan, he knows more Bible than likely all of us in this room. Seen believers come and go. Yet he still opposes God, right? Not wisdom, okay? Uh, high IQ, no wisdom, right? Because who is going to oppose the living God? Who is going to stand up against the living God? Wisdom is given from above. Theologian Ronald Blue says this on the matter. He says, wisdom is not measured by degrees, but by deeds. It is not a matter of acquiring truth in lectures, but of applying that truth to your life. Tony Evans says this about wisdom. He says, quote, wisdom is the application of heavenly knowledge to earthly living, end quote. See, wisdom is not intended to be theoretical. It's not just some esoteric idea. It is meant to be utilized in a very real and practical sense. And most of the time, we don't even need um, the change in our life that we're asking for. What we need is wisdom. Think about it. We often pray for things in our lives, and it's generally for our convenience or comfort, right? You go through a trial, God, get me out of the trial. Maybe we should ask for wisdom to maneuver and manage the trial. Because outside of a trial, how will you learn pers perseverance and patience, right? It would be like going to the weight room and saying, God, just, just uh, give me pectoral muscles, right? And not lifting the weight. The only way to get it is to push against resistance, right? You cannot escape that aspect of learning. So what you need is wisdom in a trial. You don't need a new husband or a new wife. What you need to do is learn how to maneuver in your marriage. Wives, you need to learn how to love your husbands. Husbands, you need to learn how to love your wives. You don't need always a new job. What you need to do is learn how to bear up, authority, up under authority that you don't like. Right? So wisdom is learning how to apply what you know to your life. You don't always need a change of circumstance. Wisdom helps us to learn how to maneuver in the midst of less than ideal circumstances. So let's dive in. Verse 13, right? Um, it says, who among, first of all, James, <laughs> imagine the things he's seen, half brother of Jesus. They called him James the Just, right? He's definitely, he comes straight for the jugular, uh, actually in the whole book, but especially right here in, in verse 13. And he's definitely not going to be apologetic for it. He's going to say what he's going to say is going to be the truth. And if you don't like it, he's like, that's a you problem. You know what I'm saying? So uh, 13 says, who among you is wise and understanding? Right? I'm picturing him writing this. And even if somebody's reading this letter, you almost got to pause and be like, hmm? Who among you? Oh, it's you? Okay, well, fine. By his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness, or some uh, translations say meekness, that comes from wisdom. So directly after speaking about the tongue, remember, again, this is not a disjointed text. This flows from James talking about how to prove that your faith is valid by how you work, how to prove that your faith is valid by how you use your tongue. And this is how to prove that your faith is valid by whether you have wisdom from above or wisdom that is not from above. Okay, so um, Pastor Kurt mentioned last week, he, he said that James is not concerned about individual piety, but about corporate responsibility. Notice all that he's saying in this context is fleshed out about how it's done in the community. Right. You can't just say that you have faith. How does it look when when it's working among people? You can't just say that, oh, I have control of my tongue. Right. It needs to be shown in a group of people. Also, um, uh, the same with wisdom, which goes to the point which I guess 
You can't exercise wisdom or say that you, that you have it or self-assess yourself as being wise if it's not evident in community. Which means that, and this ain't to shame anybody if you watch it online, I'm just saying that in the body is where we see evidence and fruit of who we say that we are. All right? So, so that's why we have, like, even though we're moving to um, um, a pith you, right? Life groups don't end. You don't need somebody giving you a schedule to tell you when to meet. Right? Believers in the old church used to gather because it was necessary for their Christian life. All right? You don't need people telling you to go to a park day. You should be joyous and say, I'm going to go get with believers because this is where I'll find wisdom, evidence my wisdom. Right? Be able to show evidence of faith. So this, we need community to evidence this stuff. So much like faith is evidenced by how it works among others, the same with speech, the same is with wisdom. Right? So James says, so you have understanding? You think you're wise? Bet. Prove it. Right? I'm going to be like, James going to be like the show me state Missouri. Right? He's going to be like, you got faith? You got wisdom? Show me. Prove it. So point one. Got three points. If there is no humility, there is no wisdom. If there is no humility, there is no wisdom. Plainly put, James is saying, show me a person that has good conduct and whose deeds are done in the meekness or gentleness of wisdom and humility. That's a wise person. Proverbs 11.2 says this, when pride comes, disgrace follows, but with humility comes wisdom. And see, from a biblical perspective, wisdom can't be validated simply by knowing Bible verses, right? That's not a bad thing. You should know Bible verses. But the mere knowledge of them does not mean that you have wisdom. Wisdom is validated in your life by doing what the Bible text says. If you don't uh, 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 believe me, then think about James 1.22. You know it. Uh, don't just be um, hearers of um, doers. Uh, well, okay, I'll just read it. Uh, but be doers of the word and not... Hearers only, and then what is the end of the verse, depending on your translation? Deceiving yourselves. <laughs> right? you, you say that you have faith. You even think that you have faith. You think that you're wise, but you read it, and then you don't do it. Unwise. Right? And so I think it's kind of funny, like, in culture, um, there, there's certain uh, virtues that are, I guess, kind of admired more than others, even though they can be connected. For example, if I roll up on... It, probably all of you in here, or you ask anyone, even on the street, um, do you want to be wise? What are they going to say? Yes. All right. Now, what if I ask or you ask somebody, uh, do you want humility? Do you want to be humble? Now, some might say yes, but especially in our cultural context, uh, you'll find a lot of people say, oh, I don't know about that. Or even if they say yes, by action, most of us don't desire to be humble, right? And so the funny thing is, uh, James says you cannot separate these two. Um, uh, the irony is that James says that wisdom is proved by conduct, which is motivated by humility. So it's not just having good deeds and conduct, because you can do a deed that is motivated by a selfish desire. We'll get to this in a sec, right? Or you can do a deed that's out of humility, and this is what proves that you have wisdom, all right? So James is saying that they're tied together. You can't say that you have wisdom without doing good deeds and have conduct that's done out of humility. The original language in the text expresses the idea of humility here as doing these deeds and having good conduct in the meekness or gentleness of wisdom. And meekness, as we should already know, is not weakness. It's a deliberate placing of one's will and tongue, and actions under the authority of God and subsequently under control. This sounds like somebody I know, all right, who did not revile in return, who accepted the bitter cup he was supposed to drink from. He did ask for another cup but said, not my will, Father, yours be done. He did not swing back when he was hit and punched and swung on. He didn't call a squad of angels to do harm to those he legitimately could have, right? He was not weak. He was meek and humble and deliberately placed himself and his will under the Father's will, right? We see this all throughout Scripture, right? 
Um, this is who the Messiah is. This is who we should model our life to be like, right? Now, James doesn't say this specifically, but this is the idea behind the things that he's saying. Verse 14 is the beginning of James kind of lining up and juxtaposing this, these two wisdoms together. So my second point is wisdom that is not from above. James identifies this, this fake wisdom or counterfeit wisdom. Um, he wants you to examine your, motiv- uh, your motivations and see if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition. I'll read it, right? But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambitions in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. Um, you can be sure that this way of thinking, this MO um, of, of what's in it for me, right? It's what drives culture and society. It's what the plight of the human is. It's our natural in- inclination and what we're prone to do in this sinful and fallen world, right? Even our best intentions many times are done out of ill motives. Now, here's what's funny and where you got to exercise wisdom. So it's like wisdom on top of wisdom, right? Ambition is not necessarily a bad thing, Right? It's what we teach people all the time, and there's some benefits to it. Right, You want to teach people drive. You want them to have zeal about something. You want them to be ambitious, especially if they're preaching the gospel, doing a ministry. Right, You don't want to have to coach somebody and tell somebody, come on, let me prime you up and pump you up. You want them to have ambition. The issue is, is the ambition driven by selfish desires? Right, um, And this is what we have to fight against in the church. Right, um, Is... is Is your ambition to come to church only so that you can get a word or also to serve and help others? Have you ever considered that on any given Sunday morning that God might be setting up that day for you to hear something for your life, but also for you to give that hug to somebody who's on the verge of committing suicide? Has that ever dawned on you so that when you think about, I don't feel like doing this today, or I don't feel like going to Bible study or life group or park there, whatever. I, I, I just don't feel, just it, even though not an evil desire, it's selfish. Selfish ambition. Have you ever thought or considered that uh, uh, when you smile at somebody or when you give somebody the gospel, that is the seed that, 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 that drives them to be able to, to, to learn from the Lord, to be saved, and who knows what ministry they go on to create. Right. So think bigger. Have you ever considered that you should not have bitter envy and definitely selfish ambition? Uh, Any person, any Christian, especially any Christian teacher uh, should avoid this. Um, These are not characteristics that are Christ like and they show that whoever possesses uh, selfish ambition is self-centered and not selfless. Right. I'm going to give you Paul's words from Philippians 2. Y'all with me? Philippians 2, right? Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility, we're being very redundant here, consider others as more important than yourselves. How often do you think of somebody else as more important than yourself, right? And we know how we treat ourselves because when I'm hungry, I'm going to get that 12-piece uh, meal from Chick-fil-A. I'm going to do it, right? My kids whine and be quiet, sit back and say, I'm going to have my sweet tea and, and my, my Chick-fil-A nuggets. It's just going to happen because I'm going to look out for self, right? How do you consider others above yourself in all aspects of life, but also for the interests of others? Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage or exploited, though he could have and had the right to do because he's God in the flesh, all right? I don't have to sit here and serve you because I'm God and what? Who's going to say something, right? Nobody, right? But yet he humbles himself and considers other people's needs, right? And then the verse goes on to say that all that he did, which ends up in his exaltation. So selfish ambition is what we want to steer clear from. Now, verse 15 talks about the type of wisdom that is characterized by three descriptors. So now James goes into a list. He first goes into the wisdom that is not from above. And list some descriptors. Then he goes into the wisdom that is from above and list some descriptors. So verse 15 says this. It says, such wisdom, this this wisdom that's not from above, right, uh, does not come down from above, but is earthly, uh, unspiritual, demonic. Again, James at everybody's front door, right? He don't really care how you feel about it. He's going to say what the truth is. So earthly, right? And I, I think I have it. We can put them up there. Earthly. 
which is worldly, having only this current life in view and holding it in the highest regard. Isn't that what we do? Right? We only think about the here and now often, adhering to the philosophies that originate in people and not God. This is why we have so many, and I'm going to come to your front door right here, self-help philosophies in books. Right? Now, I know this, this, you, you can get mad if you want. Okay, just get mad. Um, listen, it, it's not that every type of, of, of idea to help people and help self is evil or bad. The issue is where does the wisdom originate from and what's the motive behind it? If you go into any Barnes & Noble bookstore, uh, if you're like me, you, you go on Amazon.com and you got a bunch of books on your wish list and a bunch of books that you purchased and you still ain't read. But, <laughs> but uh, me, I'm talking about me. <laughs> but, um, you know, you'll have your sections, right? You got your history, your business, accounting 101. You got your, 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 all your religious kind of mixed together. They got your Bibles and your Christian books and Hindu books and Muslim books and, and all of this type of stuff, right? And then you'll have your self-help section which is fairly large and continuing to grow, right? The problem is people love to help themselves by their own terms and devoid of the wisdom and help from God. And that's the issue, right? The issue is not that you can come up with a slogan or saying that it's to help people, right? And it's not explicitly gospel-centric. The issue is you want to help yourself because you don't want to turn to God for help. Stubborn, foolish, and not wise, all right, and, um, uh, so we have uh, uh, quest answers and resolutions to legitimate questions and problems in life, but on our own terms from sources that we prefer, all the while attempting to ignore God or shake the fact that we are accountable to him. We would often rather try to help ourselves than to simply seek help from the one who made us and is ready, willing, and able to help us. Right. Let me pause real quick. This is 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 what we see in life. And this is the slippery slope. Right. You read God's word. Right. You know, you love God and you read God's word. But there's a day that you read something and now you don't like God because you don't like what he said. I know because I'm here quite often. Right? <laughs> and, and you read something you're like, I don't like that. I don't feel like doing that. Right. And so what you end up doing is you do what you want to do. And then you want God or you think you're forcing God to line up with what you like and what you want. And then that slips into now you have created a different God than the God of Scripture because it's the God that approves what you like. Right. And then that slips into self-idolatry because the God that you just created is really a God from your ideas or your worshiping self. Right. So the idea that you can just slip and do things by by self-help uh, and the worldly ways uh, apart from the wisdom of God, is really just self-idolatry, right? And we don't like to think of it like that, but that's what it boils down to. And the slope is very slippery, right? And so um, uh, that is earthly. Then there's another one, the second one, unspiritual, meaning natural, self-centered, sensual, being hedonistic and seeking one's own gratification in all things. And we see this in worldly wisdom quotes like, follow your heart. Do what feels right or do what's right for you. Or you know how we do in our context, do you, boo. You know? But now, and now, now here's the thing. We know that we, there's no ill intent behind any of that, right? It's not like somebody's wishing cursing and death on you. The problem is, is it devoid of the wisdom of God, right? Because uh, in Jeremiah, um, uh, uh, the Bible says, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Right. The Bible also says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Where y'all at? In the end, it leads to death. Right. And so um, we have these ideas that we think are right. Right. Oh, just follow your heart. Just follow your gut. No, don't do that. You can't trust yourself because we lie to ourselves. Right. <laughs> right. We need to listen to what God says about us, even how we feel. All right. And so now what's uh, I would even say. What's scary is the fact that we don't realize it's happening, right? We do it with good intentions, right? And so uh, I'll even get dark here for a moment with you, right? A, a person who sexually assaults somebody's daughter, right? That person did that and it's for a sensual reason, right? Out of self-gratification. They wanted what they wanted, so they did what they did. They did not wake up with a thought of, today I want to harm some father's heart by hurting his daughter, 
that wasn't the intent. The intent was I want what I want. And the impact was it had all of this fallout and all of this damage. So just because you want something and it doesn't have evil intent doesn't mean that it won't work out for evil. All right, which is why we need the wisdom of God to make good, sound choices so that we don't end up in that situation. And then the third one is self-explanatory, demonic, devilish, evil, and anti-God, anti-Christ. Now, verse 16 says this. It says, for where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder in every evil practice. James is telling us that there, is a, there are telltale signs and crime scene like evidence that you can kind of put your Sherlock Holmes hat on. Anytime you see wisdom that is not from above, it will leave a wake of destruction and confusion because we follow what we want versus what God says. And this applies to everything in life. This applies to money, right? This, again, uh, is money evil? Of course not, right? The love of money is. So when man applies and when humans apply our own wisdom on something, we have an issue in the world that is now corrupt, counterfeited, and ends up being some type of evil fallout, all because we don't look at it with God's wisdom. Sex, marriage, manhood, womanhood, justice, gender, right? The list goes on because we think of things from our own perspective rather than from godly wisdom. And this is how we end up with what James says, disorder, confusion, chaos, uh, consider this, y'all. It's important to remember that worldly wisdom is not ineffective, though. You might be surprised to hear me say that, but it's the truth. It does accomplish things. It might garner you fame. It might even secure a bag. It's just what it accomplishes will many times be accompanied by disorder and all kinds of evil. So God has set it up so that even non-believers can tap into wisdom. Right? But if it's done devoid of, of, of fearing and reverencing God, then you'll get a basic result of evil. Uh, I'm sorry, a basic result of the wisdom, but it'll be surrounded by chaos, confusion, disorder, and evil. Right? Wisdom that is not from above basically means that it is not in God's economy. You are not being wise. You are being foolish. Fools are people who are ignorant. This is what Warren Wiersbe says, who are ignorant of truth because they're dull and stubborn. Their problem isn't a low IQ or poor education. The problem is a lack of spiritual desire to seek God for wisdom. Fools enjoy their foolishness and don't even know that they're being foolish. It's a sad thing when you don't know. It's even worse when you don't know that you don't know. The outlook of fools is purely materialistic and human, humanistic. So point three as uh, I get ready to land here, uh, uh, James gives several points, more points, about wisdom that is from above, right? So verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without pretense or without hypocrisy. Um, now, this word from above, I just want to be clear, uh, James is not using some type of uh, uh, just general term, right? So he's not talking about just some higher elevated knowledge, right? He's talking about specific knowledge that comes from God, right? The, the, the gist of the word here from above is from a higher place with regard to things which come from heaven or God, right? The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, synonymous terms. Proverbs 2, 6, it says this, it says, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding, I'm going to come to your front door again. Notice it says, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So this can't be attributed to anything else. Not the universe. Not energy. Right? I told you I'm coming to your front door because some of us do this. Right? Right? The universe does not give you your purpose. Okay? God created the universe. God gives you your purpose. You understand? It does not come from energy. It does not come from the third eye. It does not come from your ancestors. It does not come from your gut. It doesn't come from burning sage. It doesn't come from crystals. It doesn't come from your horoscope. Wisdom comes from Yahweh and Yahweh alone. I, I, look, I don't mean no harm. I'm saying I don't like when people come up to me. Oh, what you, oh, you, oh, your birthday. Okay, I see you. I, I, I think I'm a Pisces. I don't even know what it is. But, you know, I see Pisces season. I, okay, whatever. 
whatever, you know, <laughs> what does God say, right? Okay, because the month you're born in should not give you an excuse to act how you want to act and not get along with whoever you don't want to get along with. <laughs> Now, the same word from above is used in John 3.31, right? It says, the one who comes from above is superior to all, okay? The one who is from earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is superior to all. John 19.11, the same term is used. Jesus replied, you would have no authority over me at all unless it was given to you from all right. So these authority doesn't come from the sage and the crystals and the horoscope. It comes from not the universe, from God. That's where wisdom comes from. All right. So when he's talking about wisdom from above, I just wanted to set that stage and then I'll run through these. Then I'm going to sit down and be out your way. Now, James describes these, uh, these aspects of wisdom from above. It is first, and I think we have, we can put it up. It is first pure. That means devoid of defilements untainted flawless and though one can obtain more of it it is in and of itself cannot be approved improved or upgraded it is perfect it is pure there is no sinful attitude or evil motive connected to this wisdom it is peace loving the wisdom uh, uh, this wisdom loves and desires peace uh, my wife can relate to this like when the kids going crazy in the house i'd be like mm, you know there's been an hour that i just want peace right but this idea is more comprehensive because what i'm really wanting is just some quiet this is more comprehensive get this right um it is peace loving it yields peace it desires peace it practices peace right this wisdom makes peace yet doesn't fake peace right and y'all know we get into that sometimes too as believers right right we think that peace is is avoiding conflict Right. And we'll say that we're being peaceful and wise just to avoid um, a conflict. Conflict is not necessarily evil. Right. Um, um, we look at what God does. Right. God is not passive. Right. When he sees an issue of sin, he addresses it head on with the death of his own son. He's not scared of conflict. And it was nasty and messy, but it yielded reconciliation and peace. All right. So um, um, don't think that. The absence of conflict means that you have peace, right? You don't want to just run into conflict for no reason, but um, there's a time and a place. And so um, peace loving. Um, Romans 14 says this, for if your brother is hurt by what you eat, and we just went over this in the Liberty series, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy the one that Christ died for by what you eat. I'm going to skip down a couple of verses. Verse 17, it says in Romans, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace. Right. Verse 14, pursue peace. So so this wisdom from above is uh, peace loving. It is gentle. I want you all to hear what theologian William Barclay says about this, um, this, this wisdom trait of, of gentleness. It describes someone who who knows when it is actually wrong to apply the strict letter of the law. He knows how to forgive when strict justice gives him a perfect right to condemn. Matthew Arnold calls this sweet reasonableness, and it's the ability to extend to others the kind consideration we would wish to receive ourselves, right? Because y'all know how it is, right? When somebody else does something wrong, you want to bring the hammer down. When you are the perpetrator, which is another flaw that we have because we don't often see ourselves as the perp, right? But when we are the perpetrator because you're the villain in somebody's story, I don't know if you knew that or not, right? You've wronged somebody, whether you think it, believe it, or know it or not, right? We want grace, Right. We'll even apologize with, oh, well, I, my, I didn't mean to. Right. Instead of just saying, I'm sorry. Right. And so so the, this sweet reason was the ability to be able to extend to others um, um, grace and gentleness. Um, this is huge. I'm trying to do this in my own parenting. Right. Because the way I grew up, um, <laughs> you know, it was yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Right. Uh, uh, kids didn't have opinions and feelings. Uh, clean your room. Do it, right? Don't look wrong, don't think wrong, don't breathe wrong, or my mom was going to pop me with whatever was closest, telephone cord, whatever it was, right? Uh, I'm trying now to say, okay, kids, I understand you're upset, you're crying, come here, give me a hug, it's all right, I love you, God loves you more than I do, now steal, 
<laughs> Go clean up your room or whatever the case may be. But I'm trying to be more gentle and not so harsh and by the letter. Right, number four, I'm going to move you through these because of time. Compliant, accommodating, uh, yielding. Wisdom from above causes one to have a disposition that is willing to yield and it's not stubborn, not obstinate, appropriately conciliatory, and not stiff-necked and unbending like some resistant animal who's messing up a plowing strategy. Wisdom from above causes a person to be willing to listen to reason and be open to appeals. Right? You ever have somebody, you just can't reason with them? Just, they want to be right for being right's sake. All right? Um, that is not wisdom from above. Um, you want to be reasonable. Um, 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, although I'm a free man, not any one slave, I've made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. Then he goes on to how he's this to that and this to that person, right? Number five, full of mercy. Being merciful, showing compassion to others. Um, not judging harshly or unjustly. This makes us like God because God is the father of mercies. Matthew 5, 7 says, blessed or happy are the merciful for they will receive mercy. So the same measure of mercy that we grant to others is the same measure God will use with us. It's an odd thing to see a recipient of mercy not being merciful, right? So the next time you consider not being merciful, just remember that mercy was extended to you um, uh, by the Heavenly Father. So full of good fruits. The wisdom from above is evident to others by the fruit it produces. This wisdom can't be relegated or reduced to self-assessment because y'all know we often grade ourselves higher than we actually are, right? <laughs> we, we, we like to think, well, let me not say you, me. I have like to think that, okay, I'm better than what I actually am, right? Um, but wisdom is evidenced by fruit, and fruit is seen and assessed in a community. So you can't be by yourself saying that you are wise. Other people have to look at your fruit and affirm that you are wise. You can't say that you are wise, right? All right? I can't be in a gym by myself saying, I think I'll shoot good. Well, I got to bring somebody else on the court and see, what, do they shoot better than me? Am, am I actually wise, right? Um, uh, or can I actually shoot, right? So it's done in community. Uh, I'm not going to beat that horse. It's already did. So um, not partial, not showing favoritism, not being partial to one person over another. James went over this earlier uh, in chapter two uh, and three, right? Um, not treating people differently because they can offer you something. They look different. Right. Or, or they appeal to you in some way. Right. Remember, um, crisis M.O. He comes for the outcast, the black sheep. Right. The one who doesn't fit the part. Right. And again, we don't see ourselves as that too many too often. Right. You are that one that Christ is coming for, the one that looks different, the one that's not welcomed in the front, at least in his economy. All right. And then finally, um, without pretense or without hypocrisy. This wisdom in and of itself and the person who possesses this wisdom, again, wisdom from above, does not pretend to be what they are not. Ouch, I'm at my own front door now. They always behave in character. They never operate under a mask. The wisdom is sincere. The one who has it uh, is who they profess to be. There is no hiding or concealing, no blush, no mascara, no foundation. None of that. Uh, I'm not saying don't do your Mac and your Fenty and all that. This is figurative. Ladies, do your thing, whatever you want to do. I'm just saying that this wisdom is sincere. It doesn't hide. It's not hypocritical. It doesn't cover anything. What you see is what you get. It is sincere. There is no disguise. I'll end by saying this. The idea is that the first recognizable marker of wisdom from above is that it has an effect on uh, your purity, your righteousness, your uprightness, your compliance, your peacefulness and mercy. It does not first impact your intellect. I'll say it again. It does not first impact your intellect. Intellect and intelligence are not signs of godliness. It is not signs of godly wisdom. Just because you're intelligent or you're smart does not mean that you are wise. I've seen too many people who lean on their own understanding and their own intellect, and when they reach the end of it, they don't believe God anymore. 
All right? Um, uh, uh, wisdom says, I don't know. Right? Right? What I know is what God has said about himself, about his word, and about me. Right? I don't have all the answers. You ain't got the answers, Sway. Right? Um, there are many foolish intellectuals roaming the earth. And just because um, we may have a more accurate or doctrinal understanding of any given topic doesn't mean that we are necessarily wise. Right? That's the indictment on Christians, right? You understand the hypostatic union. You understand eschatology, soteriology, ecclesiology, all of this. And, and, and you hammer somebody on something that's like, yo, this is why I don't fool with the church anyway, right? We was talking about a simple Christian liberty. I can't even come back to the church anymore. Just harsh and unwise, right? right? You want to be gentle with people and you want to understand that just because you understand something or make a mental ascent of something doesn't make you wise. How you apply the knowledge is what makes you wise, right? So, in closing, how we live flows directly out of what we believe, y'all. There's not only a correlation between our wisdom and how we live. It's tied inextricably. You can't separate the two. Amen? Amen. So, let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll get ready for our, our next uh, portion of worship. Father in heaven, help us to be wise. Oh, Lord, help us to be wise. Even as I'm sitting up here expounding on and reading your text, <laughs> getting hit with the very same punches, God, help us to be wise. Help us to not seek our own wisdom and wisdom from this earth, wisdom that is not from above, but help us to seek wisdom that is from you. We know that begins with fear, reverence, and honor of you. So God, be gracious to us. And for the wisdom that you have given us, help us not to set it aside and be foolish but to actually act on what you've taught us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, this portion of the gathering, y'all, we're going to delve into communion. And it's funny that um, if, if you don't have the elements, go ahead and, and raise your hands so they can come to you. Y'all can go ahead and stand up. It's funny that um, we're talking about wisdom, right? <laughs> I was looking at this this week. Peep this, y'all. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So foolishness to one and power of God to another. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will thwart the cleverness of the intelligent. Where is the wise man? Where is the expert in Moses' law? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made the wisdom of the world foolish? The world thinks they knows everything. God is making it look like fools. For since in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom did not know God. <laughs> you can't make a jump or leap to God with your own earthly intellect and wisdom. God was pleased to save those who believe by the foolishness of preaching. Look at Paul making a play on the words. The foolishness of preaching, and God is bringing people to himself. For Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks ask for wisdom, but we preach about our crucified Christ. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, yet God considers it wisdom. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. We think we know something. <laughs> God done sit here and put up a whole redemption plan with, 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 with two pieces of wood and some nails and put his son on it and called it wisdom and saved your soul. On the night that, that Jesus was betrayed, he sat in an upstairs room with his disciples. He took bread, he broke it, and he told them, this is my body that's given for you. Let's remember the... Let's remember the wisdom of God and the sacrifice of Christ. His wise plan to save us. Let's take and let's eat. And then after supper, he took a cup, he passed it around. He told them this represents 
blood of a new covenant. I don't know y'all know how serious this is. The scripture says that our offenses are so egregious to God that you can't have forgiveness or remission of sins without the shedding of blood. It's so serious, essentially, something got to die. But the blood of bulls and goats is not enough to save us and to redeem us and to wash us clean so we have the Lamb of God, the perfect one, to shed his blood. Let's drink and let's remember the blood of the new covenant. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. You're good. Oh, you're good. You're good. You're good. Again, Lord, give us wisdom. Help us to abide by what you've already showed us. Not to think of it as rudimentary or too elementary or too plain, too boring, but to be able to abide by what you've already said to do. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, receive this benediction. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation about Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept silent for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic scriptures according to the command of the eternal God to the advance, the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory forever. Amen. Go in peace, y'all. Praise God for that message. If you're like me, after hearing that, you want to sit down with somebody and have a conversation about it. Well, here's your chance. My name is Tamara Bullock, and I'm one of the members of the Surge Evangelism team, where our goal is to help you look more like Jesus. You can reach us at surge at epiphanyfellowship.org. You can reach out to us if you have any questions about the message or if you just want to hear about the gospel message of Jesus for the first time. We'd love to hear from you or connect with you. Grace and peace.